my name is my name is Morton, and I'm I'm joined here by Ben from Clubbercam and Amanda from Clubbercam as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, let's just see. Um, not many people have joined yet, but it's all good. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Ben, for doing this, and also you guys. I remember we were doing um a, doing a, a doing a talk maybe about a month ago or so. And you mentioned it to me then, and I thought it was really funny. And, and it's great that within a month it's been pulled off, and every single hour in this twenty-four hours has been filled up. And I'm very lucky to have got have got the eleven o'clock slot, which is the <laughs> next. So I'm, I'm very thankful for all that. But um, in this you hour, were the first booking. <laughs> sorry, you were the first booking. I was the first booking. I was the one who says yes straight away. I think because it was a Sunday, and it's not during the week. I was like, yeah, I can do it. I, I can, you know, I can easily fill up an hour. I can fill up a couple of hours, like to start talking. Oh, someone else has just said, said hello. Um, so how this is going to work, guys, is obviously because this is not um, a typical Zoom where everyone can speak. It's just going to be me, Amanda, and Ben. But we're going to be looking at the Q&A, and we're going to be looking at the chats. And if anyone wants to come on the screen, I can definitely invite you. So that's not a, not a problem. But if you guys have got any questions, just put it in the Q&A. It can be anything at all. It can be um, anything about denim history. It could be anything about my studio. It could be anything like show me a machine, show me this, show me that. And I'll just pull it out and show you. So it's going to go, oh, hi there, everyone. Okay, cool. So Ben's already started. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just get the Q&A up. So guys, have you got any any questions for me to, to like, kick off? Obviously, I've got, some, I've got some fillers. So it's all, all, all good. <laughs> if you get stuck. Do you want to go first, Amanda? Um, yeah, I'll go first. I want to know your Desert Island pack. Like, what book would you take? What jeans would you take, and what song would you album would you play? Oh, okay. So let's do the the, the, the book first. It's very it, it's for me. It's very easy. One second. Um, I was going to ask what favorite book. I What's actually, book? I actually this month on my denim history channel did a yeah. book club, and I just finished it, and I think I might carry it on because I did um every day I posted a denim book which I thought was really special. Because so many students ask me, and I teach as well, right? I teach at four different colleges and more than, that, more than two to three hundred students every year I teach. And they always ask me, what's your favorite book? And I have to give a reading list. And this book is one of them that I always put. Ah. So, um, Jeans of the Old West from Michael Allen Harris. Complete dude. If it wasn't for this guy, um, some things we wouldn't know about, actually, to be honest. And, um, you know, what's amazing about it is that he him and his wife um and and his father-in-law they, they go down and, and he's like you know he's like a, he's like a, he's just an, a, a, like a complete like fanatic and he goes down mines and he gets into really tricky and quite weird spots actually but he's found some pieces that even levi's didn't even knew existed you know so but you know because because you know but um i think it was 1906 i believe in like san fran had a massive earthquake and levi's lost their entire archive they're one of the only companies back then who kept every single piece of what they did and they lost, they lost it all. So even all their historical records, they don't even bless them. They don't even know what the RQA even means. You know, their, their logo, their, the main back, back pocket stitch. Could be Golden Gate Bridge, could be an Eagle, but they don't really know. But it's all, it's not, not about that. But he's found pieces that are missing. And people like him and Britt Eaton, there's a few others as well, like sort of, sort of like Victor, Fre uh, back. there's a couple of them who, who literally have found some amazing pieces. And you can still find them because denim is really interesting because Everyone always thinks it was fitted, and or why are they why are being why are they being left down gold mines or silver mines? It's because these things were overalls. They were slightly bigger than what you would wear. You put them on, you do your work, and you take them off and you hang them up in the mine. So, a lot of these amazing pieces have been found still in mines in this in this same state. So yeah, this will be the book. Um, you know, obviously, you ask a man, 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 man as well. I have to go downstairs and get some samples. Actually, if you have to give it all. While, I, while I'm while I'm while I'm doing it, but I'm, I'll do a little tour. It's really fun. So, yeah. so hi all for panel. So no questions yet, which is oh there is some chats. Everybody's saying hi. Are they all just saying hi? They just need the ice. Just needs breaking. I, I've actually got a question for you relating to what you've just said about that book, Martin. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we did a Levi's history event at the store with Phil, yeah. uh, he I had did. different samples and different pictures and he said a lot of what they find they notice that the left hand side of the leg as in if you stood wearing them mm. is worn out and, the, and, and and he mentioned he said and we don't really know why that is you and i always skewed no like literally like worn out like it's only, only have a right leg for yeah. example and 
Surely that's because everybody's right-handed. So in mind, the lane on the left-hand side. Well, it could be. It could be anything. It could be anything because obviously jeans leave an imprint. They leave memory of what the person's wearing. You know, um, I remember I did a jean for a famous photographer called Nick Knight, and he told me he's always one. He's always taking photographs. He's a photographer, so one of his knees is always on the floor. So that knee always got worn out really fast. So if 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 things are worn away in certain areas, you can work out what they were doing, or at least make an assumption of what they were doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, um, um, that's what's amazing about denim is it leaves the, imp the imprint and you can, you know, I found garments in a market, I found garments in Bangkok and we've worked out exactly what that person was doing when he was wearing these jeans. And that's what's remarkable about denim. And it, it's all because of the way it's been dyed. So, because obviously um, the core of the yarn is still white. So, you know, you, you, it just leaves like an imprint of you, so, which is quite yeah. amazing. That's what's, that's what's like sort of like unique. And they only dye denim like that because it's, the, it's actually was a very convenient and cheap way of dyeing because you didn't have to use the whole dye to do the whole yarn. So they only mm. did the ring dyeing method. So it's just, they were trying to save money, but that's what, in result, that's what we all wear now. That's why, that's why chinos and those other gar hunter garments, they don't wear down as nicely because they're not, they're not dyed in the same way as how denim is. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, let me give you a little tour and find this pant or find this garment that Amanda asked me to. So, <laughs> yes, okay. Ooh. So, 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 so this is actually where I work. It's a bit messy today. So obviously I've been quite busy. <laughs> really slow. Wow. A lot of people complain that you're too fast, Morse, and you don't show what you're doing. So that's a darning machine. That's a uh, Unispecial 4300G. It's a really amazing jukit that can handle up to 30 ounce. These are some banners. You can't be a denim designer without having banners. And this is some of my book collection that I featured this month. Okay, I'm going now. That's more of my archive there. My wife's walking up the stairs. Hey, son. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. How are you doing? Let me just know. Uh, this is Sadio's studio, bless her, where she works. She's been cutting loads of videos for the guys at 10 Cell the last couple of days. And, uh, Yours is a typical man. <laughs> is there some very like, illustrative? <laughs> anyway, I'll take you downstairs now. So, of course, lots of denim stuff everywhere, lots of banners. And then let's find um, some nice denim, some pieces that you asked me about, what would be my desert island piece. So this is one of my rooms. I've got a couple of rooms in this house full of machines and workshops. This is my other workshop. Um, more amazing machines. Um, Corneli machine, a triple needle chain stitch machine, a, a double needle one eighth chain stitch machine, a triple needle uh, three sixteenth machine, which is absolutely epic if any of you know what that means. Two different Bartax, uh, Reese 101, all good, all good, all good. Lots of denim dogs and cats, everyone needs those. But let's sit this down and I'll give you a little, uh, sorry, it's a bit, a bit dark in here. There we go. Oh. Right. The piece that I think is amazing is this piece here. This is the 1874 blouse, Levi's blouse. This is actually the, the piece that started with the whole trucker jacket thing. So everyone always talks about trucker jackets at type one, type two, type three. For me, it's this, this guy, really amazing. And, and Michael Allen Harris actually found one. It's one of the oldest ones that stays found. And Levi's now own it in, in their archive, which is really, really cool. So that would be probably one of my Desert Island ones. And um, another one, so I'm really, um, well, let's get the light here. I'm really, I'm really, really, really into um, researching super duper old stuff and even stuff that predates Levi's, if that's something, if that's any kind of, you know, respectful thing to say. Because denim just, the denim just didn't appear out of nowhere. It just happened, and, but it was obviously a tailor called Jacob Davis who made the first pant and the rest of it. So I'm looking at really old tailoring from the 1840s and 1830s now. So what influenced what we wear now, which is quite fun. Andy Arnie's speech is about the history of the denim fabric up until the five pocket jean. So that'll be really interesting. Well, the earliest recorded uh, fabrics that, they, that, that actually Levi's was, was using was a duck canvas. So it wasn't a three by one and it wasn't indigo, it was duck. So the very first jean, even on that patent drawing from May 20th, 1873, was a duck. So it wasn't indigo yet. So that's a fun, fun thing. Fun little fact. Um, so I'm looking at super duper super duper old stuff at the moment. So stuff with a split back split back yoke and waistband, um, you know, lovely cinch buckles. You know, these are the kind of things that I get super excited about, especially all the dart manipulation. Really amazing because I'm like a, 
a frustrated women's wear designer. So I put darts in, in, every, in everything. So yeah, it's quite fun. Um, <laughs> your other question, Amanda, what was your other, other, other question you asked? Your song or album that you'd have out there? It would probably be a jazz album, to, to, to be honest. Um, I listen to a lot of type of music now, a lot of soundtracks and a lot of video game stuff. But it'll probably be a, um, a like Grant Green, he's a guitarist um, album, some kind, probably Street of Dreams or one of these other ones. Or, um, yeah, the, probably a, a jazz album from, from like Blue Note. I've got a silly amount of uh, CDs, actually, from when my student days. I think when I went to university, I spent my student loan on an amp and music. That's all I spent my first year's loan on. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how much <laughs> I, I was enjoying it. But um, let me go back upstairs. I'll give you a little, little tour again. So if anyone wants to see any of these machines or ask about these machines... Uh, well, we have got a question uh, from Mr. What's, Wilson. What's Matt the, Wilson says, uh, your brand, Endrime, yeah. is, quite, is quite unique in, the, in, in your details and aesthetic. What would be your top three brands you would say you pull influence from? And I'll, I'll, I'll say that, obviously, I know it's going to be... Pull in, I pull influence from, or, or, or what, is that what they mean? Um, I think, basically, if we were to say vintage clothing is yeah. one, what other two places, maybe not vintage, do you pull influence from to create uh, your end dream products? Um, to be honest, uh, um, I've been a denim designer for 18 years and I studied fashion as well. So most denim people that I meet, most of them, then they're not designers. They're the people with money or they own a factory or they just have an idea and they make a jean. And, and they, most of the time they just copy a Levi's or a Lee, put their le leather patch on it and think they've got a brand, which I don't think is really the, the case of having a brand. So, um, so for me, I... I um, because I understand about pattern cutting and fit and especially construction and I'm into my, into my machines. I, I made it a mission to, cause I worked for Levi's and I worked for these really big companies, really big companies in the start of my career. And obviously um, when I wanted to make a pair of jeans, I, I figured out, you know, quite early on actually that um, the jeans that we all wear have been standardized from, from after the war. So, you know, if, I, I, from 1870 to about 1922, it, it actually fluctuated quite a lot how a jean looked. You know, it had extra, you know, it had an extra tool pocket here. It didn't have the, it had, didn't have the left pocket yet. All these things were added on like gradually, and then after the war, it got standardised. And when it got standardised, I don't think it got standardised to the correct way. So that's when the overlocker was invented, and they started cheapening out how they made things. So I just went back to looking at all the things that I didn't like about a jean. I said, okay, I'm going to do the waistband so it's, it's actually differently. I'm going to put a one-piece fly back in, in, in there again. And these are all things that have been done in the past. I didn't invent any of them. Like, you know, one-piece fly was invented by um, the guys who did Boss of the Road. Um, Boss of the Road, all their patents are now owned by Lee. Lee don't do anything with, 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 with like any of it. So it's like, you know, tech companies and that. When they go bust, other tech companies buy them out. Similar scenario happened here. But I just, um, I just took apart a couple of jeans you know, have, having known how to make them because I've been working and designing for them and try to do a best of, like try to do a version where it wasn't any compromising at all. So um, no overlocking was the start of it all. And then, um, then it went to a point where, because I don't like how the waistband is finished with a chain stitch and sometimes it's a bit rough on the inside. So I did it more cleaner. Um, I just looked at every single component and made it as clean as I possibly could. And I, I wasn't worried about price or I didn't care about customers even. It was just purely for me. And then... Um, I had a few people asking me, hey, do you mind making a few more? And then next thing I know, I was supplying to big, big brands and big, big stores. So I'm very lucky position. And now I consult. So I, that expertise goes into loads of other people's work that some of it I'm not even allowed to talk, talk about. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, well, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I've got a quick one. Uh, so we, you, you, do the, you do the teaching, you do the consulting, you, you do a lot of fabric. Uh, construction like you'll go yeah, and work with a lot of development with fabric yeah. yeah that's true i think you've got it goes you've, hand in hand actually, I, I, actually i'm gonna go upstairs because it's more fun but no. if anyone wants to ask more questions about dead garments i'll, I'll just come down here here again no. uh, that little tour of my house again which is quite quite fun so you've you've got all these different things that you work on and then you've got your brand as well yeah. if, if if we had your time on a scale 100 percent where do you find at the minute, day to day, you're spending the most time? Is it 50, is it 33, 33, 33, or is it 80% consulting, 10% teaching? I spent now, I spend now probably about, um, it's, it's actually, the, actually I'll do it differently. I, I, um, I teach in the winter. So most, um, the colleges that I teach at, I teach at the Royal College of Arts, 
London College of Fashion, Westminster and Ravensbourne. Most of those teaching gigs, um, they happen in the winter from September to like Jan. So from September to January, about three or four days a week, I'm like teaching. And yeah. then the rest of the year, I'm consulting. So um, um, I, one of my, the biggest consultant that we've got at the moment, who we've had for t- nearly two years is, is like Tencel. So they're the guys that make yarn from trees. And that's mm-hmm. been really inspiring, actually, working for them. Because, um, you know, I, I've been a bit dis- disenchanted the last few years, um, questioning if I should be making products, because there's so much of it out there. And, you know, and, um, and um, now there's a purpose again, because now it's like a race. It's a race, actually, now to design the most sustainable gene. And everyone's, everyone's on it. So either using Tencel or your laser finishing or using hemp or whatever it is, or you're, you're looking at the way we dye yarns in a different way, using foam dyeing, or there's so many different technologies. Every single process of making a gene, that's from the cotton stage all the way up to finishing, every process people are now looking at to making better. And that's what's super, super exciting. So I've been working for Tencel, um, but I'll say, yeah, I'll probably say, it's a 60 40 divide. So 40% is teaching and 60% is consulting. And I'm still doing my brand as well, but it's just a very low key thing. And it's, I do lots of collaborations now. That's what I do, especially in, in, the, in the Far East. But yeah. Uh, another question's come in from uh, Miss Cathy Riley. Nice. Uh, it's an interesting one, Martin. Go for it. I'll read it out to you. Uh, basically, she's emailed you as well, so you might get this question. Oh, okay. Uh, I asked a question. What we term as a pocket watch, mm. also used as a condom pocket in those oh, days, made from pig's intestines. Is yeah. there anything you know in this? I actually shared this one question because I have a denim group, uh, all designers, probably about 15, 20 of us in the UK. And I shared it because I went, what the? I was like, what the? You know, like, what the? I said it on the print screen and, sh- and, sh- and, and like, shared it. But, um, Go, I, I read it wrong. I thought it was like, do they make jeans out of pig's intestines? I went, no. But no, yeah. What, basically, she was talking about condoms. She wasn't talking about the coin pocket. But basically what it is, that um, the coin pocket has been the one pocket that's actually changed within time. So um, it's the one pocket that um, every few, every 20 or 30 years, they rename it. It's really funny. So like originally, it was called a match pocket for matches because the miners used to have little candles and they used to have matches. And, and Miles, Miles Johnson, ex like Levi's um, and like Pat- Patagonia told me, they stopped calling it a match pocket because when people bend over, they, they break their matches. And then, um, you know, obviously it's called the watch pocket as well and called the coin pocket. I know it as the coin, coin pocket. And um, in the early 2000s, they started calling it an iPad pocket and made it much more bigger. This is when iPod, sorry. And, and of course, condom pocket, which I think is horrible. But yeah, um, but yeah that, anyway, it's, it's, that pocket it keeps on getting changed its name. But everyone always talks about the coin pocket being the fifth pocket. It's not. It's actually the fourth pocket because the left pocket came after. So everyone always talks about the fifth pocket being the coin pocket. It's not. It's actually the fourth pocket. That's interesting. Yeah, a little, little bit of denim trivia there. Yeah, yeah because, you know, because for many years there wasn't a left hand left left pocket. There was the coin pocket came straight away. So you know, it was, it was a, a tailor. And Jacob Davis, the guy who, who invented the patent, was the guy who put the coin pocket on the first pant. So that's why if you look at the very first pant, it's very tailored in origin. It's got a curved waistband. It's um single needle tailored. It's, it's all the nice things that we all love. What I love. And um, but yeah. Anyway, let's see. see. You're, you're, you're reading the question, so it's probably better if you carry, if you carry on. So I don't lose yeah, my I, uh, I wanted to know, uh, back to not, not who inspires you, but other than the work that you do personally. So yeah. uh, what brands do you look at and think, wow, they're really... It doesn't even have to be a denim brand. You might know, but, you know, like what brands do you look at and go, wow, they're really... They're really on it, brands. transparent. Yeah, there are many brands, you know, there are many brands. And yes, I, I, I loved love Levi's, of course. And, and, but I love the Levi's era from the, from the early, early part, up until the 20s. And then after that, I don't, I don't really concentrate anymore because I'm interested yeah. in all the smaller things. Um, um, I, I, I love Boss of the Road, another vintage brand that no longer exists. Um, but more, more, more current brands that people might know. I love a, a Japanese brand, um, uh, Train of thoughts gone. They come to me in mid. No, no, I love a Japanese brand called like John John Bull. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, I love a, a, a Dutch British brand called like Denham. Uh, Jason's a good friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a few, of course. And, and there, but I love lots of women's wear as well because I'm a trained women's wear designer. So there's loads of brands from Story, MFG, I and Me um, that are super amazing. And I'm more interested in brands now that are doing more sustainable stuff. Not not okay. Sustainable. Sustainable is a really silly word that's been used a lot but literally 
brands that are making a bit of a difference and um you know and they're really you know even to their packaging and they're not doing it for marketing they're doing it because they really do care and um you know and having had my own brand for nearly 10 years you know i'm having to rethink a lot of things that i'm doing you know uh, i'm going to rebrand hopefully soon and, and re relook at all the things that i do but um i'm quite enjoying the consulting part it's been really like rewarding we're giving knowledge to other people and letting them do loads of great stuff with it so yeah mm -hmm. I think on that um, that sharing of your knowledge as well, Morton. I think um, you would be doing a lot of teaching now as well. That's amazing and lecturing. Like, what is it that you get from that? Do you get the joy of just sharing your knowledge, or is it seeing the new things coming out of the students? Um, I, I really enjoy um, educating really young people. Like, what I mean is, it sounds a horrible thing. You can hope, don't quote me on that. But basically, what it is, I really enjoy someone who's like sixteen or seventeen years old who's never even worked with denim before and I've inspired them to do something really creative and I've opened their mind up to it. And it's a really magical thing when you, when you teach someone and they, they literally, whoa, they get really excited about something that you just taught them or they learn something from you. It, it's really like rewarding. And I've been doing it for nearly 15 years. And, um, but, um, but no, I really enjoyed the teaching part. I've done it. I, I think I, it all kick-started for me because I went to a shout out to Cone Denim here. I went to Cone Denim, Denim College together with Amy, Amy, Amy Leverton in back in 2004 or 2005. And we did this for like a three day thing. And we went, we went to Greensboro and we got taught by technicians who were in their you know, 70s and 80s. And um, this is in the North, this is in the White Oak plant as well, which is, which is now closed. So um, after I did that course, my tutor at Westminster, my old tutor found out about it. She goes, do you mind coming in and telling the students about your career so far and telling them about your denim college that you just went to? So that's how it started. And then ever since then, every every few years more colleges found out and then now i'm now i'm teaching the uh, the master's levels at the rca and i'm involved in developing a phd course quite soon uh, so i'm going we're going to be making doctors of denim like real doctors of denim so it's um it's a real big thing that we're doing actually now and i'm i'm oh, i'm one of the guys who are putting it together which is really really fun and very honored to do it but yeah i don't know if that answered your question but i really enjoy teaching i've yeah. always like always liked it and i always do it as well and every job I go into or if it's, or if it's a consultancy job, I always offer my services to the younger junior members of the staff. They've got to go, do you want me to give a little denim history lecture? And they go, yeah. So, you know, and, and um, I do them all the time. Like every month I'm doing one, either if it's a live one or if it's in person, I do them in, in my studio and I do them a lot at, at, at universities. I do a summer school as well, where we make jeans and um, do denim. We do like a five day workshop where we do uh, one day denim history, uh, two days um, making a pant and then two days making a jacket like of type two. It's quite quite hardcore, uh, but I've had a lot of people do it. So yeah, that's, that's very cool. good. And then I'm guessing you can take them garments away with you after you've done that. Oh yeah, the the idea is I've had a few people come on my course, and they think I'm making it for them. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to show you how to do it. So there's some people have like you know, but I get people from America and even the Far East come to fly in to do my course. It's a very special. I'm very honored whenever they do it. And you know, I only limit it to about 15 people or so. And they sell out, they sell out. So it's quite cool. But, um, but you no, know, the, the idea is that you make it yourself. And I've, I've taught even kids who are like 11 years old how to do it, who've never touched a sewing machine before. So I just turn the machine, the speed down really slowly. We have a little sewing class for maybe 20 minutes at the beginning. So they get they're comfortable with their machine. And then we go and cut the pant. We get their size right. They pick the fabric they like and then everyone at the same time, once they've finished cutting, we start making it the same. I make one as well at the same time. So they watch me, then they go back and they kind of like Blue Peter kind of scenario. So uh, <laughs> I think, have, have you done one of them? You have, right? Yeah, me, yeah. me and Carl did it with you yeah, and it was amazing. Right. You, you guys actually did one at Black Horse when I was there, because I was at Black Horse, I still work, I still consult for them, but I, 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 did, I did all their masterclasses for about a free four year period. But then they got busy, I got busy, and then I wanted to do more with uh, bigger, bigger groups and, you know, Black Horse, those guys, bless them, they can only accommodate like 15 people. And if I go to a university, they have all the pattern cutting tables, they have every single machine. So I can have up to like 50 students and I've done it with about 60 once, 60 at the same time. So yeah, <laughs> um, I was speaking to uh, some friends of mine in China and they were like, do you mind coming over to China and we hire out a factory and we do it with 200 people? And I went, sure. <laughs> so yeah, it's not gonna stop actually. How you make yeah. really good premium jeans, yeah. So the yeah. non overlocking method. Hmm. I think that's really good for people that's interested uh, in what you've just said, because there could be people thinking, hang on, I'll, I'll give that a go. Oh, or, yeah, completely. No, uh, how, how do they, uh, you know, what way do they go? 
to to book on to see where you're at. Oh, okay, if you just go to my um, because I have a couple of Instagrams. People always get like, why have you got so many Instagrams? It's because I have my Endrime Instagram, which is my brand, and then I have a denim history Instagram, which is all my education work. And then I have my personal Instagram, which is just pictures of my of roses and flowers from the garden, which I don't know if anyone wants to see. I think they're great. But I've had a few people give me abuse on it, going, Where, why not pictures of denim? And I'm like, just follow my other two accounts, dude. So, um, you know, it's, um, so yeah, I've had to separate my life out because uh, it's got really confusing. Yeah? Putting yeah. workshops in different accounts, I don't know. So I have um, the best way to find out about any courses, and I do them literally every, every month. So I'm doing a couple of free ones in the next few days. I'm doing a hemp panel. Um, which is going to be on Zoom. It's a one hour hemp talk with some amazing denim people as well. And hemp history, we're learning about hemp and we're learning about um, the two different types of hemp. And then the positives and negative. Neg I've got some cotton people coming in as well. So it's going to be a bit of a heated argument, um, cotton versus hemp. So it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be on the 4th of June, I believe. Just go on my denim history Instagram, click on the bio, you find the link. It's all free and you can, we can watch it. For, uh, for, anybody, for anybody listening that doesn't know, Morsin, uh, what is the difference between cotton and hemp? Because oh, hemp is thrown into a lot of marketing, uh, you know, 10% hemp, 30% hemp, and, right. and I'm guessing okay. a lot of people don't actually think about what it is. Hemp is actually quite remarkable. If you, if you, if you, all, if you all tune in on the 4th of June, I'll be talking about it for an hour, but I'll try and sum it up in a few minutes. But basically, hemp's been around for oh. millennia. It's been around, we've been using hemp earlier than cotton. So, you know, it's one of the earliest yarns that we've ever used. And it's actually one of the strongest yarns. It's stronger than, stronger than like linen and hemp. It's strong. It's, oh, sorry, it's, it's actually stronger than cotton as well. So, but the thing is, in the 1800s or so, it got a bit of a bad rap. And in the 1920s, it actually got banned. So, um, and it was mostly propaganda from the cotton people. Because what it was that cotton is interesting because cotton came about and it, it, they figured out it's, it's a lot slightly more easier to... A process and because of slavery and it's to do with slavery as well because of slavery they could get cotton at a much cheaper price so um all of a sudden the cotton people started to bad mouth the hemp people and said it's a devil's drug and all this other stuff and not hemp is quite different to cannabis sativa it's like a different strain and it looks it looks identical but you can't get high can't, can't get high off it and um because they've been using hemp forever from making all the ships that found America were using cotton sails and, and cotton ropes and things. I'm sorry, hemp sort of like sails and ropes. So it's like, it's been around for ages. And only recently, since the 80s, they figured out a new way of spinning it. Because obviously, um, if any of you join any of my classes, you find out like cotton, any kind of fiber, you have to spin it to make it into a yarn. So whatever, whatever if it comes from a plant or whatever it's coming from, or if it's come from a tree, you have to get it to a, a fiber kind of state then you can spin it and twist it and keep on stretching it until you get it to the thin, thin yarn that we use now. Then we either weave with it or we sew with it or whatever. So um, hemp's quite similar, but hemp up until the 80s, they used an um, a older style. Well, the, the only type of way they could spin hemp was called um, wet spinning, um, which is very, um, the only way to uh, make you understand it without having showing pictures is um, it looks like linen. It's very rough. It's very coarse. Um, but now they figured out a new, a newer way of spinning it. It's a different type of process and it's called cottonized and no joke. If I show any of you guys or any of the people who wants to know, if I show you a cotton or show you a hemp gene made from cottonized hemp, you would think it's cotton. So it's just to do with price. The price is the main issue at the moment, but I think within a few years, everyone is jumping on hemp, like all the big brands, all the big mills. If you go to any mill that, that makes denim, they got a little hemp story going on. They all, even Candiani are doing a big hemp thing. So everyone's doing it. So, um, and the price will come down. So, but hemp uses less water, for instance. So I think it's like um, a quarter of the amount of water used for cotton is, is what you use for hemp. And hemp, the, the, the land that is grown on, you can grow, I think, twice as much hemp that you can for cotton. And not only that, the hemp plant, every single part of it can be used to make oil, to make whatever. So, and it takes care of the soil. Actually, there's too many positive things about hemp. It doesn't make any sense why we don't use it. So that's hemp. That's interesting. Yeah, it's really, but tune in on the 4th of June, because I have lots of specialists with me as well. I'll do a little denim history. I mean, a, a, a hemp history for about 10 minutes. And then it's a Q&A from lots of specialists, probably like grilling me and I'll be, I'll be like grilling them. So it's all live. And none of it's like scripted. So it's going to be quite fun. And look, there's it's Miles Johnson, White West. Blue uh, talks. Carved the blue one. I do lots of stuff with Ten Cell. Yes, you're you're right, Amanda. Um, and we were talking about you actually, Amanda, to to join one of our panels. So we are we are discussing it. But um, 
but no, um, I work for Tencel and and and, and, and Carved in Blue as well. So all the uh, Instagram posts and all these, me and Sadi have been actively involved um, helping them and making videos for them and, and um, doing webinars for them. But no, this particular hemp one, I, I wanted to do it. So I, I just ran with it. <laughs> I did it's really been amazing. Uh, all I just, the talks have been incredible. Yeah, they've been really fun. And you can, you can, anyone who wants to see any of these talks that I've been involved with or any of these other denim people have been involved with, there's, um, if you go to Blue Lens on YouTube, they're all there. They're all there. And we upload them within a few hours of them finishing. We just upload them, put titles on them, ed, so we edit them down and we upload them. And it's been really fun doing it. Uh, we've, got, we've had four questions come in. I've just realised they didn't show up on my computer. So sorry, I'll, uh, I'll address that one now. We've got 30 minutes. We're more, more than okay. Lovely. It says, uh, this is from Fushang, and it says, how do you visualize or plan a new collection every time? From where do you find inspiration? And what would you suggest students and freshers who are taking denim as their career on? What all things should we concentrate on? And what are the resources available mm. so they can understand the core of the denim gene? Okay. I get inspired by lots of things. I get inspired not just by denim. So um, I, um, I'm, I've got an archive full of so many things, you know, from jackets to pants. Yeah, this room's full of denim, but I've got lots of military stuff as well and tons of books and magazines. Like I'm, I'm um, now, it's very much easy. You can go on Instagram, type in raw denim or vintage denim and you get tons of things. But when I started, it wasn't really like that. I had to research quite a lot. And, I had to buy lots of Japanese books to do it. Um, but for me, it's just immersing yourself in it. It's like, you know, first of all, understanding the history is quite important. And then researching some brands that you like. You know, I, you know there's some really early brands that aren't documented still, like a couple of Chinese brands that were at the early part of the denim, you know, from the 1800s. Because back in San Francisco, there was a big Chinese community there. So some of the early patents had Chinese names on them for denim, denim-like details. So not much has been documented about this kind of stuff. And um, but even the whole history of denim, it's a very it's a gray area for me. You know, everyone always talks about how it, it all came from memes or whatever, whatever. For me, it, it, you know, the fact that it's written on Wikipedia isn't really, it shouldn't be the fact, actually. Because there's loads of things that, you know, even like the three by one twill, you know, um, you know the, 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 all the denim that we wear now obviously was done on a Draper loom, which was in America. But the guy who invented that loom was a guy called Northrop who's a British guy. So it's a very gray area, like who invented what, what did what. So when you start researching stuff, you ask yourself questions and you start researching. I, I, I read um, a paper that my friend like Rowan did. He shared it with me. He's a, another denim designer. He, he teaches as well. And, um, you know, and I dis we disagreed on some of the points on this paper. It's, it's, it's completely fine. Like I said to him, oh, you know, I think it was a question about who invented stone washing. And, you know, in his article he written, it, he said it was like Francois, like sort of the Jibo, whatever. And, Everyone says it is him, but I worked at Edwin Japan, and the main guy, Edwin Japan, says, no, I, I actually did it first. The, the European guys actually copied me. It's, it's a very gray area, but the moment you research more, you find out more, you start asking yourself questions. But for me, it's always better. Even my friend Ben um, from Canada, uh, that's an amazing denim designer as well, and, and Taylor, he learned, many people have learned by taking apart jeans and understanding it. That's the way. I didn't learn that way. Because I, I learned fashion first. So I learned how to make trousers first and tailoring. Then I went into jeans. But some people learn by taking things apart. And same thing with painting. You know, to become a master, you have to start copying other people's work before you start making your masterpieces, if that makes any kind of sense. Um, there's there's uh, a sort of question within a question there, actually, Marcin. Uh, I think what he's trying to say, now that I've read it back a few times, Okay. All this research to do, all these different profiles to look at, all these different websites to learn from. And I think what he's trying to say at the end here, which I may not have got across, is he's basically saying, I've got so many hours in a day, what would you advise I focus on first? If everything else comes afterwards, just starting out as a beginner, what do I focus well, I on? I think first? being a designer that sews, like, yeah, you can, anyone can draw, you know, and do a little doodle or do technical drawings, that's fine. But you can't be a designer without knowing basic pattern cutting and without sketching. And I think draw and try and imitate some things that you like. Um, maybe get a tracing wheel and copy some pocket shapes that you like, or just understand how things are made. That's the first thing. And then, and then understand about design and trend and fashion and things that you like. And you might design a pant which has four pockets on on the back. You know, it's it's pants are very they're you know they're workwear. They're they're made for a purpose. Originally. 
they they didn't put things on for no reason you know so it was there you know in the shape of the pocket is the shape of the tools that they were using down a gold mine so it's like um or silver mine sorry so it's like you know it, everything's for purpose but for him uh that like gentleman who asked the question just immerse yourself in the subject but for me i'd go about it where i'll research things i'll buy a couple of things i would I would start like, yeah yeah so if you want to be a designer understand fit fit is a really important thing you know right now it's a big um it's a big thing actually to have things that don't fit very well and um you know being a train designer i find that really frightening like you know when things i see people and you know, they get thousands of thousands of likes and they're wearing the most ill-fitted garment i'm like i don't get it so but that's me as a as a, as a train designer um, yeah okay. We've got a uh, we've got a question from Catherine Lovell. This is an interesting one. Uh, it uh, it touches on sustainability, but I, but that's not what the question is. What she's saying is, what do you think will be the next big thing once sustainability is embedded across the board? It might be years off. So once like the the next big thing, sustainability. When that's done, what's fashion? What's design? What's next? Um, sustainability is never going to end so it's always going to be uh, a race or not race it's always going to be a mission to try and make the most cleanest product ever and you know um, we know now from the last 30 or 40 years how we make jeans is, isn't sustainable at all so how we, how we grow the cotton to how we dye the cotton to how we wash our jeans to how we destroy our jeans to the environments they're, they're in to the people who do all the work so the whole process is this bad and 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 um so yeah, it's going to take a long time. So, and they are really amazing place, really amazing factories and people that are trying to sort this out. Like there's an amazing company called Cytex. They're based in like sort of like Vietnam and they've got the most advanced denim factory ever at the moment. I, I visited them last summer and um, everything was on conveyor belts. There's no ovens to dry stuff. And it was really amazing. But, but going back to the question, like what is the next big thing? For me, the next big thing is to try and design a gene that's not using cotton and that's not using uh, petro petrochemicals. So what I mean by that is indigo dye that we all love and we all love it and we'll worship it. Actually, most of the indigo dye, nearly all of it that we use is based on a formula that a German scientist made in 1897. So it's not real indigo at all. Yes, you do get real indigo in like Japan and Pakistan and India and Bangkok, wherever, but to have a brand that uses natural indigo is actually really hard because you need a football field to make a very small cake. It's not really sustainable either using natural indigo. So the race is actually, because uh, indigo itself is it's made from benzene, it's made from rat poison, it's made from oil. It's one of the worst dyes ever, to be honest. And if that, so, but there have been solutions that have been made and even in the last six months to a year, there's a, a, a new process where you can do, um, get indigo dye from bacteria from in from natural indigo and someone's figured out a way how to make that bigger so within the five or six years hopefully they'll be mainstream but then the, also polyester is a super duper evil thing nearly every single gene okay we're all denim people we probably wear 100 percent cotton and we're proud of it but you know 95 percent of all the denim that's sold has got stretch in it so that stretch either polyester or lycra or whatever these are elements that have come from oil again and they shed microplastic into the environment like Every single, every single person on the planet has got a credit card size amount of plastic in, inside them. So that's, and even babies have got, got plastic in them and fish has got plastic in it. So this has all come from polyester from garments that we wear, including denim and sportswear garments. But denim uses a lot of polyester. So the race, the future to me is actually not using cotton, not using polyester and not using petrochemicals, but still having a gene. So doing clever ways of doing it. So yeah, that's why. There's, uh, there's some good information on that uh, coming up a little bit later as well with Candy Arnie. I'm not ruining it. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm sure they're, they're one of the leaders of it. Uh, I'm good yeah, friends. Uh, they were, they were, they were they've briefed me a little bit, obviously, and following on from what Martin said, if people want to know more, uh, you'll be able to check them out. Candy at, at six o'clock is one that I'm actually tuning in for. So that's actually yeah, the one that I'm making. It's a really on. good one. Uh, just ooh. to expand on that as well though um mawson what do you think do you think brands should be shouting about the sustainable stuff they're doing or should I they just so. be doing it anyone who's not okay anyone who hides where things are from they're doing some stuff bad and no brand is perfect so any brand that says they're perfect they're lying and also something that i found out in one of the uh, transformers eds because i do lots of hosting on other people's talks especially for kingpins and transformers i do a lot of talks with them there's a cotton talk that I did with Andrew Olar, and I found out, well, we all found out because we all watched it, uh, only 0.5% of cotton is organic. Not even 1%, 0.5%. So that means 
anyone that says they're using organic cotton, most likely it's bullshit. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, you know, and if a Zara or someone else or high street brand says they're using organic, it most likely isn't. So, cause it's not possible because you can only grow, only certain amount is grown. So it's a real gray area. And yes, you can get, cotton's a really murky subject. I'm going to, to half on about it, but you know, every single process is now regulated now. So, so they check and even how the buildings they're in, if you go to any factory, they give you, they show you like certificates at the door again, where lead certified gold or we got GOTS or they got all these certificates. But the cotton process is the one process that's not really regulated that much. So I went to a, a lead certified platinum factory. So this is like top, top, top. And they were still using kids. So it's a real gray area. The whole, yeah. it's a very murky world, our fashion world, unfortunately still. So, uh, we've got a good question here. It says, Mosin, I've asked this before, but wondering if you ever managed to find out what, I think this is, this is from Ilya. So I'm guessing it's our buddy Ilya, Il Cuts. I'm okay, guessing. Well, Mosin, I've asked this before, but wondering if you ever managed to find out why vintage denim blouses have cuff buttons on the inside of the sleeve. I do know why actually, because um, like most denim, as you know, was workwear, and these blouses in particular, these work, these wear blouses work in factories. If the button is that you scuff the work, you scuff the table, you you. So if it's on the inside, you you protect the work. That's All right. Hmm. Hey, I do know that one. Surprised I know. Eh, <laughs> uh, let me have a look at this one. This one's from Val. I'd love to see how you construct, attach a one-piece fly. I've improvised my own method, but curious how legit denim makers do it. Do you have any examples of this on your Instagram or elsewhere I could learn from? Yeah, I do. Um, actually, I know I've documented all, all, all of them. So um, back in, um, so I found out about the One Piece Fly actually from a few brands. Obviously, I researched quite a lot. So the, as I said, Boss of the Road were the guys that invented, in, like, invented it. But the first time I physically saw One Piece Fly was actually in my friend's brand, from a guy called Mark Westmoreland. And he's, he had a denim brand called the One Jean or something, I believe so. And um, he only made a hundred pieces or so. And this was like a best of jean, including bits of Levi's, Lee. He had a, had a car heart, a heart button. It had, but it had the one piece fly. And that's the first time I've actually physically saw one. Then I think a year later, I saw Denham do it as well. Jason Denham put it on his own brand. And then um, I decided to put it on mine. I, I decided after researching it and after figuring out how to sew it, first of all, it's a very tricky thing to do. But um, I, I've now documented it. Now, um, I know of like four different ways of doing it. And each way is slightly different. And um, I, I videoed myself doing my Enderime way maybe eight years ago. And I posted it online. It's on Vimeo. If you just Google it, you'll find it. You will find it if you Google it. Maybe not Google it. If you go to Vimeo, Vimeo is very strange because it doesn't come up on Google for some reason. So you have to go to Vimeo and then search for it. There's loads of videos of me on, on Vimeo, but no one can find them, which is funny. But I've got one about the One Piece Fly. And I did that maybe eight years ago. And then um, because I teach denim as well, and I go to universities and I teach, I was teaching at Rave Ravensbourne four years ago. And there's a technician there called Mar, Mar Bell. She's amazing, actually. And um, all these technicians are, they're all amazing. And she was looking at my one piece fly going, I can do it better. You know, I said, please show me. So she actually perfected it and made a slightly better, ver better version. And then I, I also, I showed it how, I showed it to Black Horse Lane. So I taught them how to do it before they opened their first before they made their first pant. And when they were prototyping back in 2014 or well, a year before they, a year before they began, they, um, they asked me to help them consult for them. So I helped them on some of the details and some of the machinery, but I helped them how to make a, a really premium pant. So the standard that they use is actually the end rhyme standard, if that makes any kind of sense. And, um, but yeah, no, there's lots of, do lots of documentation. I've, I've done it, a lot of posts about it before. But I can do another post about it on Denim History if you want to find it. I'll put another one. But I'm going to do, a, um, I'm doing a book about how things are made, about construction of genes. And each of the four methods are going to be in that book, including the older method and my method and the Black Horse method. And then the Marvell method. I've called it the Marvell method. I've named, named, named it after her. So, yeah. Cool. We've got a couple of anonymous questions, which I think are probably from the same person. Uh, huh? And they're, they're just asking for a bit of advice, really. First of all, they're asking, you know, do you consult for homegrown labels, which I'm guessing means smaller ones. But then it goes on to say, what is the best tip slash suggestion you can give a small denim brand uh, that might be struggling due to COVID? So this is the first time we've actually touched on 
this subject. This to me sounds like somebody that's just started up. Yeah, it's, I feel I feel for people that are starting only about a year ago or six. I know yeah. many young designers who have started their brand and it's a yeah. big pick up for six months. They can't do anything. But I think um, I think you should always keep busy. That's the main thing. Always have a really active Instagram account. Always share what you're doing. Um, you know, and if you share more things, people get to know you much more. You, less bullshit, really. It's less mm. marketing as well. If you're just being very honest. But um, I, I think it's all about having that presence and, and having a difference. You know, if you're just going to, as I said, copy a Levi's or Lee and think you've made it, it's not going to happen. You need to think of it very differently, have a different point of view, um, make something that hasn't been done before or, or style it in a different way and um, photograph it in a cool way, document it. Always, you know, I, I use platforms like Issue to have book booklets on and I'm always um, making videos, always be making videos from the very beginning. Um, but I think this being transparent is the way to be now. Is that you can't, I remember speaking to someone and I asked them where their cotton was from and they said, oh, it's a secret. And it really irritated me. I said, you can't hide things anymore. You can't just say it's a secret. You know, it's okay to say that you get your denim from Pakistan or it's okay to say you get your trims from Turkey. You know, everything can't be made in England. It's not possible. You know, and I think Black Horse tried to do that and they figured out actually our, our fabric comes from Turkey or Japan, our trims come from so-and-so it's just put together in England. It's like have, everyone wants to have this romanticized story about made in the USA or made in England. I don't think it's that, I, it's unnecessary to, to be honest. And um, it's more sustainable sometimes to go somewhere and make it there and then ship the whole garment somewhere else rather than ship all these components from everywhere and all the rest of it. But um, and transplant is the key. It's like, you, it's like you said when we spoke a month back, it's, it's not where it's made, it's how it's made. Yeah, it's how it's made. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, look, you, you know, people always um, disagree with me, go, oh, China's not good and Pakistan's not good. Go, no, 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 no. Where do you think Jeff, where do you think Japan gets its cotton from? You know, it's, it's like, you know, um, it's, it's, it's how you make it, you know, and you, know, you can get an amazing product from China, an amazing product from India and Pakistan and parts of, parts of Africa, the rest of it. It's just, it's just if you're willing to pay for it and if the designer is willing to go there and, and educate them how to do it. Because whenever I go to a factory, I often buy them like machines. I often say, have you got this machine? They go, no, I'll, I'll order you one. <laughs> if I'm going to work with you, you need to have this machine. Otherwise, I can't work with you. So it's like, I often educate the people I work with, which is quite funny. But yeah. No, it's well, part of your job. If you're consulting, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, they're paying me. It's best that I give them the best knowledge I can. Or, or, and I'm, you know, I'm wrong as well. Like, I, you know, but um, I give the most, I try to give the best knowledge I can, or I don't mind giving away knowledge because it's the, if it, if it, there's no point keeping it or hiding it. I know people that hide stuff and they go, oh, don't show anyone what you're doing. Or It doesn't really matter, to be honest. Even if I show you the same mood board, you and I would design a different pant based, based on it. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, that's great. It's almost like, uh, like what you've just said there is almost like busting the denim myth a little bit. That it has to be USA made, or it has to be yeah. made in the UK, or it has to be, you know, all this. Yeah, it, it's kind of denim is international. Yes, it was um, a, a Jewish German immigrant too who figured it out, and they were living in in America at the time. So you know, but it, you know, it, it's got its roots in European tailoring. If you look at a denim jean from the eighteen seventies, seventies, it's basically a tailored pant that a tailor made, and, and that. And it's a, and, and and you know it's got a lot of uh, workwear details in there that are, are tailored or Jewish in or in, in origin as well. So the moment you understand the root of it, you can, it opens up a lot more, and you start looking at other things that are really interesting. Um, but no, it's just research, 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 and getting excited about it. And um, but yeah, but being honest and transparent is really the key now, and and making things properly. I've been saying this from the beginning, like from the start of my brand. Everyone laughed at me. I was very, I was one of the first brands that was transparent where I, I even showed you what millet came from, what machines I was using, where it was made. Now it's become quite standard, but I was one of the first ones to do it. And I remember my business partner at the time was saying, why are you sharing this knowledge? Why are you putting it? Why? And I went, it's someone's going to ask me and I can't be bothered to remember it. I can't <laughs> be bothered to remember what machine I used or what fabric it was. I just put it on the pan. Yeah. <laughs> <was> just, <laughs> convenience for me, actually. Would you also go as far as like with Everlane, where they put how much it costs to make and the processes yeah, like that? Yeah, I'll, I, I can happily do that. That's no, but everyone always is, everyone is shocked by some prices that are, are some of my products. And I remember, I think even like my friends at Story MFG, they get abuse as well by all oh, your stuff is too expensive. And, I'm, and, I, and I joked with uh, Saeed and Katie going, well, you know, we're paying people properly. We're paying people properly. We're using organic stuff. We're doing it all properly. We're doing it all, 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 all like legit. We're not, 
we're not hand carrying the samples in in a carry bag and then not like declaring it on like on on like duty there's so many things we're doing correct but then it's expensive for that reason so you know if it, it's the people i question a jean that's six six quid at like primark you know it's like i question loads of and and i buy those jeans to understand how they're made i buy all of it so i buy loads of competitors things and i i often oft, so just to analyze it because I do often get jobs where I do need to design a really cheap pant for a high street supplier and I need to understand how, how they do it. So I have to research. I'm still learning myself, but I, I, I design at both ends of the spectrum. So the super cheap stuff to the super duper expensive stuff. So, yeah. This is, uh, I know we, uh, we're slowly, slowly running out of time, but there's one yeah, question left. Come yeah, in. Let's just go through the question. It's, I'm not sure if this is one you'd answer on here or whether you'd just point them to one of your websites for this month, mm. but they've put, uh, Basically, they've said, us as designers, can you teach or help to help to teach or help to consumers to choose sustainable stuff? And what is important? So basically, what is important in terms of certificates? Because there are so many, it's very confusing. It is very confusing. And I think um, our friends at, King, at Kingpin Show and Denim PV and, and all, all the major shows, the trade shows that have all these suppliers come, they're asking all of them to be a lot more better with their certifications. They're trying to standardize. It's going to take a many years to do this because everyone's yeah. got their own standardized, you know, we use this, we use got, so we did it. But I think that if you've got small brands, let's just say you've got a small brand and it's starting and you're buying your, your denim from, I don't know, Isco or one of these other mills, you know, it doesn't, you can ask a simple question. Is the cotton um, BCI, is it, is it, is it uh, you know, and that's better cotton like initiative. There's certain things you can ask for. And if they say it's not, then just walk away going, I'd rather not buy from you. Because if you, you, there are certain things you can find out. And even where, and I would say that if you are going to make jeans or make any kind of product from t-shirts to anything, try to visit the factory that you're making it with. Don't just rely on the internet. Like, you know, try and book a 600 quid ticket and go to that factory in China or go to that factory in Portugal for two days and spend time, photograph them making your stuff, photograph their environment. And then you can be transparent in your website and in your branding and in your marketing going, I visited the factory and yes, it's, 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 it's doing this, doing that, but it's doing these positive things as well. I think the key is to just ask lots of questions when you make anything now, because, you know, after COVID, you know, I necessarily, we all want to be very careful what, what, what we wear and how it's made and, and if people are being paid to pay properly, all the rest of it. So, yeah. And this is a fun one to finish off, I think, Martin. Mm. Uh, somebody's just put, can you please show us some of your denim mood boards? <laughs> mood board. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I don't know if I can share any of my mood boards because they're all, they're all on my computer. But I can... <laughs> We just want to see more of the studio. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure, that, that, that's fine. The that. <laughs> um, thing is, Having a book collection is super important. I've got, I'm really proud of these Levi's books here. Oh my God. It's been a mission to try and get all, 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 all of them. Try your hardest to get all the lightning books as well. They're very e e easy to find. There's a lot of denim guys from Son of Stags who everyone who buys, buys them. Um, but more of a studio. I don't know. What else do you want to see? Do you want, do you want to see? I, I know, I've shown you all of my machines already. But, um, Have you got your first ever jean that you made? Sorry? Have you got your first ever jean that you made? I have actually. I can see it right now. It's up there. It's like a grey one up there. I can pull it down for you. It's quite well made, to be honest. But um, it's it's um, if you want to see it, you want to see the first ever jean I ever made. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So jealous of all your banners. I nearly uh, I nearly broke my whole studio there. This <laughs> is, yep, it says it here. Mawson's first jean. Wow. So this is actually a jean that I made in Singapore when I worked for DKNY jeans and um. I found out that we were going to go to England and um, it hasn't got a one piece fly yet. It's still clean construction though, which is quite fun. It's got salvage pockets pocketing. It's got the turn back, so it's quite fun. And um, I'd already figured out my back pocket stitch at this, this point as well, roughly. I think there's an early imitation of it. Um, sorry, the light's not so good here. There you go. So hand branded mode. So I actually went out and I, I designed my own branding iron. So I, I, you know, after researching it, I didn't want to waste, I was very conscious about it. I didn't want to make thousands of leather patches. I only wanted to make one every time. So I made my own le leather patch and that's actually my name in Arabic. If anyone can read it, it actually says Morsin, like Morsin, like Sergeant, which is quite fun. And then, um, but this is the first thing. It's using a like Caravo selvage, which is fun. I got given some Caravo fabric, I got like 50 meters from Caravo. So they're one of the first people that sponsored me. 
And um, because I'd worked, I'd done loads of work at Carabo. I did, um, I built up their entire business at like DKNY Jeans. And um, when I was leaving, like, like talk about, talk about, talk about, talk about DKNY Jeans, they said to me, what gift would, would you like when, before you go home? And I said, I just need some of that really nice uh, H -K HXDX fabric, selvage fabric that you get from Japan, like 50 meters. And they just gave it to me, which is fun. So I've still got a little bit of it left, actually, that one roll. But yeah, this is the very first jean that I ever made. So, um, and by this stage, I'd already designed my own rivets and buttons as well. You probably can't see them. They also say my name, name on it as well. There we go. Yeah, it says Morsin on the button, which is really fun. So this is before it was called Endrime. So I was going to call it Morsin, Morsin, Morsin Sajid, my first brand. But then I found out because I was getting, getting like, getting like sort of like investment. And I was advised by a few friends of mine don't put your name on anything because if you if someone buys your brand and you no longer own it they own your name and i was like shit so um i had i had endrime as a backup and endrime where the name comes from actually um it's a very very like sort of a romanticized thing it's um endrime is the earliest form of love po love poetry so um, i love you i need you i want you it's called endrime if you didn't know and it's it's what it's, a, it's actually the rhyming language which the Chinese, the Indians, and the Arabs came up with at the same same time. So it, all root languages are endrime in origin. So because I was a very purist denim designer, that word resonated with me as a younger person. So I actually registered it as well. I spent a lot of money having that name. So yeah. So no longer Morrison Sargent, but you never know. It might get res resurrected. I've got another brand called um, Morrison Special as well, which is really fun. And um, some early prototypes had Morsin Special on it. I think I remember showing a jean to Kia at Self Edge. We're talking like 10 years ago and he was joking to me going, you know, you can't do that because Union Special will come after you. And I went, eh, and I, I didn't do it in the end, but I kept it as my blog name. So yeah, well, Morsin Special. <laughs> but no, okay, that, that, was a good way. that was a good way to end it, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been absolutely brilliant, Marcin. Uh, if anybody wants to know any more, uh, Marcin's handles, if you just want to read your Instagram handles out, just again, Marcin. Yeah, uh, I've, I've got um, at Denim History, um, yeah. I've got at Endrime, of course, and I've got my own name, Marcin, Marcin, Marcin Sajid, and, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And I've got another one that's to do with our consultancy, you can find it, it's 74MMA, uh, 74MMA, and um, that's all my consultancy work, so all the lookbooks that me and Sadia, my wife create, and videos that we do for do for lots of brands but do check out blue lens and do check out denim history uh youtube accounts there's loads of great videos on there especially blue lens because we update that nearly every other day so uh, this cool. video will be probably there within the next few hours but i really appreciate everyone's time i have got some questions here i should just check check them i've covered i've, I've covered them so the, the, the desert island one i've did uh what's your favorite denim brand um john ball i've said it already denim book i've already said it mark hughes wrote a question what's your general innovation of denim industry joe public going forward um i think i've answered that question what are you excited about the future um and not using cotton or or, or like polyester is there any further in innovation in like in in like in like construction we've been doing a lot of interesting constructions uh at, at, at like universities using sound waves and ra radio waves so bonding fabrics together not using any sewing sewing machines so um there's lots of, and, and knitted jeans are coming into their own. I'm not a fan of it too, too much, but they're slowly coming in, into their own as well because it's all about not wasting when you make stuff as well. Um, so that's quite for a fully fashioned jean. Uh, historically, denim industry is focused more on the past, maybe less so in the future. Should fashion be moving away, away from trend finally? Yeah, I, I think it's, it should be all about making stuff like properly. Like I've been saying from the very beginning, like I, I, I teach for many years, I'm not a, 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 a big fan of trend. I get, my gene is actually made because I didn't like the way how things were made in the past. So I enhanced the construction so it's stronger. So it wasn't about trend at all. It was just about, I hated overlocking and I, you know, I wanna make it better. I, you know, if you're gonna spend 300 quid on a gene, why the hell is it overlocked? That's what I think. So um, anyway, I think it's coming up to an hour. Thank you so much. Amanda, Ben, thank you for your time. Thank you for thank you. talking with me and asking me questions. And uh, we'll be jumping over to Red Wing now. So yeah, Red Wing, watching. midday. So, Mohsin, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, we'll see you later at the Euro Hang, maybe. Yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, what time's that? Nine o'clock. Oh, in the evening. Oh, 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 oh. I'll be there. Lovely. Bye, guys. Take Bye. Care. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone, for listening and your questions. Thank you so, so much. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.